Thank you. Thank you very much. I do not know George, but uh, the tribute in music and in words described a beautiful person. And the reception to those two tributes just says how warmly you all feel about him. I wish I had known him. However, I do know Alex, and if George was hard to say no to, Alex is even harder. He's been at me for a couple of years to do this. I'm glad to be here, and uh, I hope we have a, a good and pleasant evening. I ended up getting interested in writing a book about the canoe because of CBC. They started writing this contest called The Seven Wonders of Canada, and they started it off in the morning program with Sheila Rogers, and they asked people to send in their, their recommendations, and then they started having votes, and then the National got on board, Peter Mansbridge took it up, and it became a real cause celeb. They got well over a million contributions and votes. Uh, leading the pack was uh, the Sleeping Giant up in Thunder Bay uh, with about 160,000 votes, which was very interesting since there's only 110,000 people live there. But. <laughs> There were, it was it really got out of control. There were accusations from the Niagara Falls contingent that the people up in Thunder Bay had set up a robocall, a deal that was voting every 10 minutes. And so, but to winnow it down, to try to get to the seven, they, they, they brought in three supposed uh, judges. One was Roberta Jamison, the First Nations lawyer, and the other one was Ray McGuire, lead singer for Trooper and for some reason they brought in me. So we had to work and work and work, work away at this. And we all know what Canada's like. No matter what, in the end, we will be, we will be politically correct. <laughs> but I thought this time there's going to see an example of, of Canadians being geographically correct. So I know we're going to have regions involved here. And I thought, what can I champion that really has no location? Is there a Canadian wonder that I could argue for that really exists everywhere and that pertains as much to the north as it does to the west and to the center of the country and to the Maritimes? And so I settled on the canoe and I started arguing left and right about it. At one point I lost my thread, but I gathered it up again. I was the guy who deep sixed the, the sleeping giant, for which I got two death threats, by the way. <laughs> So eventually it came the voting, we, we got it down and we decided on the top seven. And I was stunned. Peter Mansbridge on the national news opened up the news that night with the number one choice for the wonder of Canada. And it was the canoe. Number two. <laughs> number two was the igloo. Number three, of course, you could not have Niagara Falls excluded. Number four was Old Quebec City. Number five was Pier 21, where so many Canadians came to this country from other countries and landed there. Number six was Prairie Skies. And then for number seven, well, they found the greatest mystery and the greatest wonder in the history of this entire country. Uh. <laughs> Dion Phaneuf in an Ottawa Senator's journey, Jersey. So anyway, it actually was the Rockies, but my, uh, <laughs> my own experience in canoes, I was taught to canoe by my mother. She was born, born in a tent, as a matter of fact, in Algonquin Park at Burley Lake, and lived there in the park for 17 years. Her father was, was the chief ranger there. And uh, the only way that her and her, her brothers and sister could get around was by canoeing. So they canoed everywhere, and, and all of them were extremely talented canoeists. So I was taught by my mother. My grandmother also canoed. And what's interesting about her is that she was a very a little Irish pepper pot. And when they built a home on McIntosh Lake, they built on a small island. But my grandfather, who'd been a chief ranger, was so frightened of forest fires that he kept the wood stash on an island nearby. So he would be out chasing poachers or whatever, and storms would come, and she would have to go and get the wood. She would paddle over, retrieve the wood, bring it back to keep the place warm, and she could not swim a lick. That's my Aunt Mary, who was a really superb canoeist. But there was another connection, too, and it was that Tom Thompson had been engaged to a maiden aunt of, of ours. And uh, so it was a very tragic story. I wrote a book about that as well. 
about Tom Thompson and the woman that he loved and the woman that he left behind. And he left her 14 Tom Thompson originals and she kept them wrapped up in newspaper and stashed in a six quart basket. And you know, today those go on the marketplace for $2 million a piece. So you can think of her having $28 million worth of paintings in a, in a, in a basket that had pears at one point. And she wouldn't even have running hot water, she wouldn't even repair her roof, and she wouldn't even have central heating in the small house that she lived in. After she died in 1962, she was uh, in her 80s. Uh, we believe absolutely that she had a child by Tom Thompson that the Thompson family would never acknowledge. She gave it up for adoption. Uh, she'd lived this bitter and tragic life. Died in 1962. They tore the building down where she lived just down the street from us in Huntsville and a small medical clinic went up. And a few year, more years passed and the town of Huntsville decided that what they would do to bring in tourism and make the town more attractive, they would put up murals of Group of Seven paintings and Tom Thompson paintings. And irony of irony, on this building, on the exact spot where Winnie Trainer lived out her terribly tragic life, this is the one that they decided to put up. There's Winnie and there's what they put up on the wall where she lived, Tom Thompson's empty canoe. Beat that for an irony. So I was still thinking about doing a book on canoes when I sat for days and days and days and stared at this painting. You know it very well. It's, I think it's on the Mattawa River. It's down the rapids by Francis Ann Hopkins. And the reason that I stared at it was I was waiting for the prime minister. And what happened was, for some reasons unknown, I was asked if I would help the prime minister, who was Stephen Harper, with a book on hockey. And prime ministers lead very busy lives, and I would go down to his office every now and then. And this original painting was sitting right side, outside of his office in the center block. And so I would sit there and stare at it and think about this book and canoes. And then we'd work a little bit on the, on the hockey book for a while. And at this moment, he's telling me, he says, he's, he's explaining to me that he, he became an economist because he didn't have enough personality to be an accountant. That's a good line, isn't it? That's his line. He really did say that. And, you know, this is not a political statement in the slightest, but it is somewhat of a shame that he never, ever let his personality shine or even be demonstrated. He did it once when he sang the Beatles songs. I can't think of any other time. He's actually quite witty. And I thought I was pretty witty, too, because we worked on this book for a long time, and finally the book's done. And he comes up to me and he says, Roy, Roy, I wonder if you'd consider perhaps writing the foreword to my book. And I said, sure, Prime Minister, as long as you're okay with me signing it, Senator Roy McGregor. <laughs> well, Nigel thought that was the greatest idea he'd ever heard. <laughs> Prime Minister liked it. One week later, <laughs> if I'd made that crack, a week later, I'd have been escorted off of Parliament Hill. There wouldn't have been a hockey book. So the Prime Minister was very unhappy. But anyway, I kept at it and decided, well, I will write a book about the canoe. And I'll try to do it in a different way because there are so many wonderful books about the canoe. There's so many people who know so much more about the canoe than I do. There's so many people who have traveled far more rivers and northern, had more northern adventures than I have. But what if you looked at the canoe as one of the great Canadian characters. What if you wrote a book about the canoe and thought of it as a living creature? What if you wrote a book about the canoe as a biography? And so I, that was the approach that I kept in mind all the time, to try to tell stories about the canoe. And there are stories that we don't know about that involve our, our canoe and our canoeists. And the most fascinating one for me it's a story about the 1885 Nile expedition. It was Canada's very first entry into the real world, very first entry into international affairs for that matter. We were a brand new country. There was an uprising in the Middle East, very, very similar in many ways to what was going, is going on today with ISIL and that. There was a rising religious figure called the Mahdi, and the Mahdi had brought his troops and his people up, and they were driving the British and the Egyptians out of the Sudan. And they had surrounded a famous general from the United Kingdom in Khartoum, his name, General Charles Gordon, Chinese Gordon he was known as. 
And the British media were so adamant that the Brits do something about this to save Gordon before he was surrounded and beheaded that they put the pressure on the British government. The British government finally caved in and said, okay, we're going to save Gordon, but how are we going to save him? And they turned to Viscount Wolseley, who was a rising star in the military ranks in Britain. And 15 years earlier, Wolseley had been in Canada, and he had been the British general in charge of what were we going to do about this uprising along the Red River, the Red River Rebellion, Rail's first rebellion. So what he did was to get to Winnipeg to put this, this uh, uprising down, and what ultimately led to the creation of Manitoba, was he hired voyageurs, and he got Mohawks, and he got river, river runners, and he got people who knew how to canoe, and they took him up and took him into Winnipeg that way. And he thought it was such an amazing way to travel and it was so effective that why couldn't they do it on the Nile? So the word went out, let's get some voyageurs. Well, there was a little bit of a problem in that in those years between his first action with the voyageurs and 1885, the rail had come in and was going across the country. There really weren't any voyageurs. They got some Mohawks. And he got a whole bunch of people from the Ottawa Valley, including my father always claimed his grandfather. And so I'd always had this inkling about this, this Nile expedition and what it was like, and I wanted to know more. Well, eventually 386 signed up for it. And they were people who were really looking for something to do. It was toward the end of summer, the harvest was in, the lumber camps hadn't opened yet for the winter, and they were offering pretty good money. Let's go over for a few months, let's save this British general and let's come back. They didn't even really know where they were going. A bunch of uh, bank clerks, board bank, bank, bank clerks in Winnipeg joined up. They went down to uh, Ottawa and they gathered, there's a picture of them in front of the parliament buildings just before they went. And they had a big party for them and these guys got drunk. <laughs> and they took them on a train and they took them down to Montreal and they got drunk again. And they kept losing people and getting people. Even today, with all the research and all the papers that are available, we don't even know who went over there. <laughs> we know some of them. They had medals to give out after they, they got back, and they didn't know where to send them. They went down to Montreal, and they got drunk. And they went up to Quebec City, and they got drunk again. The governor general was in residence up in, in Quebec City, Lansdowne, and he gathered them at the trip there, and he just ripped into them. He said, you're going over cross the sea to represent your country. This is the first time Canada is being seen on the international stage. Behave yourself, do your country great honor. Yes, sir, and then they went out and got drunk. <laughs> they stopped off at Sydney for supplies. They got drunk again. One of them went into the school, little school and took over the school and when the cops came to, to, to take him out because he was giving this speech to a whole bunch of grade threes and fours, he punched the cop out, knocked him cold. By the time they got to Liverpool and that word had spread and they wouldn't even let them off the ships. <laughs> they go to Gibraltar, they won't let them off the ships. They get them to Egypt and these crazy Ottawa Valley voyageurs and aboriginals behaved magnificently. The Brits had built what they thought were canoes but they modified them greatly. And this is what they were going to take up the Nile. And they started going up and the Canadians were brilliant absolutely brilliant. They saved lives, they got them up through the Cascades and the various rapids and that, but they couldn't get there quickly enough. Now had they got there quickly enough and saved Gordon, it would have been one of the great stories of, of history. Uh, it certainly would be a Hollywood movie, it should be a movie anyway, but they were short, they didn't get there. Wolseley panicked. He decided, I've got to send my men by overland because we're not moving quickly enough in the boats. So he bought a whole bunch of camels. He loaded up his British troops on the camels. The camels turned around and bit them. Because camels can do that, you know. The British thought they were horses. They could ride, they just jammed their spurs into them. The camel turns around and bites you in the head. So they didn't get there. There's what happened to Gordon. He did get beheaded. They put his head in the, on a pike. And the poor Canadians were sent home. They got back. They paraded up and down Wellington Street in, in Ottawa. Some of them had those great Arabian swords. They had turbans on their heads. Some of them had monkeys on their shoulders and cockatoos that they were holding. They, they sang songs and, and paid them great honor. Great editorials in the paper. Today, 
We don't even know about it. That's the only re mention there even is that any of this stuff ever happened. It's a plaque that's hard to find on the Ottawa River. It mentions Gordon, and it mentions the Governor General, and it mentions Wolseley, and it doesn't mention a single name of a Canadian that went over there. The Forgotten Nile Expedition. It's just one of many stories that involve our beloved canoes. I went into uh, a lot about the recreational parts of the canoes. Basically, it was this, this fellow with the Rob Roy canoe, John McGregor, no relation, who paddled around Europe and got people really interested in the canoe. And the canoe had another great advantage over, say, the bicycle or the front porch in that people soon discovered that it was the great way to court. And canoodling, that famous word that we aren't supposed to say, actually had a very nice connotation at one point. It was just meant to be the romance of the canoe. Chaperones wouldn't get in canoes. So you could paddle off, we'll be right back, and in slip under the willow tree, and you never know what would happen. And canoe clubs became extraordinarily popular, especially in the United States, and it had an awful lot to do with courting. They even built the Canoe Museum, had a magnificent exhibition last year. I don't know whether people saw it. I hope you did, because it was really good. And they even had one of these specially built courting canoes in there that have a, had a built-in gramophone. <laughs> it was fantastic. And of course, you know, there's this, and then there's that. And... <laughs> and I did another chapter on Blair Fraser. Blair Fraser was really important in terms of uh, people like us discovering the North and discovering the Canadian Shield and falling in love with that, those parts of the country that the Group of Seven and Tom Thompson painted. He wrote uh, for Maclean's. He was the auto editor of Maclean's. He had his own weekly radio program. He talked an awful lot about the love of the wilderness and just the joy of getting out and about. He canoed with a group. They called themselves the New Voyageurs out of, out of Ottawa. And uh, he, was, he was quite an adequate canoeist. He loved it, and he went out every year and as much as he could. In the spring of 1968, you know, I, would, I would guess that every single person in this room has made at least one mistake in a canoe. He made a mistake that cost him his life at Rollway Rapids on the Petawawa River. He and his partner didn't seem to see the slip off, the, the, the uh, portage point, quickly enough. They got caught in the rapids, went down, went over, his partner made it all right, and Blair Fraser did not. So he died there. And after he died there, it was decided that they would put up a memorial plaque to this person who had meant so much to the Canadian wilderness and so much to canoeing. They put up a, a small cross. This is on the Des Moines. This is not too far from the area. This is a friend of mine, Phil Chester, and I we were going down there one summer. And we had heard that some uh, self-righteous, hyper-environmentalist had ripped out the cross and not only had he gotten rid of the cross that had been put up in Blair Fraser's memory but he then wrote letters to people in high positions in the Ontario and federal government saying that he had done he had returned God's land to God and he had done the right thing and that it was a sacrilege to ever have anything like this anything like this that was man-made in such a pure and wonderful area this was his opinion anyway well, Phil and I went up and down the Petawawa with our daughters, and we tried to find the cross. We couldn't find it. And lo and behold, very shortly after we went down, water levels got even lower. Somebody saw a glint, and guess what? Found the cross, thrown into the water, its jagged edge sticking up that someone who might have been lying in a canoe or whatever on those rapids could have stepped on it and cut themselves very badly. This is being environmentally friendly. I mean, good God. But there was another point to it, too. That cross served as a warning, a caution sign, and something to make people think. So that many people here, I'm sure, have done the Padawawa, and if you walk along, even if you do shoot the rollaway part of the rapids, you would walk up there and you would see that cross, and it would be a small reminder that you're engaged in a wonderful sport, but also a dangerous game. And the tragedies do at time happen. And Phil said at that point that when, when we went in to try to repair the cross, he said that it's very possible that cross saved lives. People who thought they could shoot the rapids then decided to scout the rapids, saw the cross, and said, well, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll, we'll do it this time. So I contacted Graham Fraser, who was an old friend of mine from journalism days, who's now the official languages commissioner, and I said to Graham, would you and your family like to be taken in there and repair the cross? Because we now have the cross. 
he was very excited about it, but he was terrified. Uh, he, he agreed to come. He wanted to come, very badly to come, but he had never been, and he had never done white water, and he was afraid of white water, with very good reason. But he brought his two sons, and he brought his grandson, who would be Blair Fraser's great-grandson. And they came in, and they paddled down. That's Graham in the back there. He's one of his sons, Malcolm. And there's Graham himself working on the cross, cleaning it before they put it back. It was a really a lovely, lovely moment. And he did it right, put it back in place with his own grandson, who had never, of course, met Blair Fraser, but now knew a bit about his great-grandfather and what he'd meant to the country. We're leaving now, and Petawa was not a really difficult river or anything. Graham's still af afraid, and not very long after this picture is taken, what happens is he goes over. And he's wearing size 13 sneakers, and his foot gets caught underneath the seat. And he said at the moment, he said, he was certain that his father's fate had befallen him. Well, it didn't happen. He was fine when he got out there, but it was a, a, really a, 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 quite a moving moment because you could see how frightened he was, but also how proud he was that he had gone over and survived and he was going to be just fine. For that family, I think it meant the world to be able to do that. Because of uh, learning to canoe from my, my mother, I, I certainly wanted to write a chapter that involved uh, women canoeing. Canoeing is not a male macho sport or something, so it's portrayed in deliverance, for example. It's, it's a sport that has had marvelous, fabulous women canoeists from First Nations right on. There's another Frances Hopkins. There's the, a woman we know from Huntsville, Christ, Christina Leadums, who has basically paddled across the country by herself. And she's done the longest portages, the great 12 mile portage and that. And I, was, I asked her, I said, well, you know, you must have had some harrowing moments. They, I said, what, what was the most frightening thing, thinking it would either be a rapid she got caught in or a flipping or bears that she had run into? And she said, well, you know what really scared me were the cows along the North Saskatchewan River. <laughs> They're just so curious and they wouldn't stop. They'd come right up to your tent and poke their heads in. Uh, Shauna Kearns uh, has a cottage on our lake up, up by Huntsville. She's a very slight woman. Uh, she went up to uh, uh, Tomogamy and became very involved in the program, ended up leading 58-day canoe trips up the Porcupine, and that, or the Copper Mine, sorry, and it just has a wonderful life. I put in a chapter as well about reinventing the canoe, which has happened many, many times in the past. I had written a book on uh, the Crees of James Bay and got to know Billy Diamond quite well. And they wanted to rebuild and recreate the famous Hudson Bay canoe, the freighter canoe. There have been so many lives lost in James Bay which can whip up in a moment. And what he wanted to do was, was recreate the canoe in a better way, in a more safe way. So he went to Japan and he talked to Yamaha. And Yamaha got extremely excited about it. <laughs> what made them so, so most excited, Billy said, was they kept looking at me and thinking that they were related to me. They couldn't get over <laughs> how much I looked like them. So he was convinced that he had played that card, and they invested an awful lot of money in it, millions. And they rebuilt the, the canoe, and they called it the Korea Yamaha Canoe, and it was really a marvelous thing. There's a lot of excitement about it. When the first prototype came off the line up in Waskaganesh, Billy's Town, which used to be called Rupert House. Uh, the, the Japanese uh, Yamaha executives were all coming over by private jet to, to see that moment. And, and uh, Peter Zosky, who got uh, word of it, wanted to have Billy on in the morning to talk about the new canoe coming out. So this was a Sunday, and he was going to be on Monday. Monday morning, the uh, Japanese would arrive, and Monday morning, Peter Zosky's show would call. And I had gone up there because Billy wanted me to see the opening of the canoe factory and everything too. But first he said, I'm gonna send you and your pal, my neighbor, Doug Sprott, to come up with you. You're gonna go out for a little bit of fishing and up the coast for a little tour just to see how it works so you can write about it. So we went off with Lawrence, his, his dear friend and his brother. And what happened, we got out in James Bay on a very lovely June, late June day, and we're instantly in the worst storm imaginable. Sleets coming down, the white calf, the wind is so strong it's just clipping off the tops of the white caps right into our face. We're covered ourselves with tarps. And 
we would go up on the waves so high and crash down so hard that it was just like falling out of a one-story building on flat under your back, the, the pain. We found out later, but none of us would say anything at the time, we were all so scared, but we found out later that the two Cree hunters were convinced that we were about to buy it. But no, we got lucky. We, 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 we caught a break somehow, we found an island, we put into the island, there's the boat that uh, the Yamaha had helped the Crees design up there, or the canoe as they called it. The Cree hunters moved very quickly. They were able to put up uh, poles and, and uh, using that tarp that we had used to cover ourselves, they built a very nice tent, uh, which you can see right there. And uh, <laughs> that's Billy when we got back. So we spent three days on this island. The Japanese came in their fancy plane and uh, didn't find their boat, so they went right back to Japan. Peter Zosky phoned and nobody was home to talk about the canoe, so they hung up. <laughs> Three days later, we come straggling to the camp. I had so much fun in those three days, I wish that we could, could have gone on. And Bill, I said to Billy, weren't you worried about us? No, no, why would I worry about you? You were with Cree hunters. But that's Billy's attitude, and he's gone now, and we miss him. Another chapter has to do with a very curious friendship between Pierre Trudeau, who loved canoeing, and that's a picture that Justin uh, gave me for the book. That's Pierre taking Justin down one of his early whitewater rafts. And the friendship was with Bill Mason. And they were really as unlike two peas in a pod as you can get. Uh, Pierre Trudeau raised by the Jesuits, uh, keeping all the emotion inside, uh, not given to exuberance or anything like that. Bill Mason, a leprechaun of a man, filled with emotion, dancing, laughing. For whatever it was, he gave Pierre Trudeau something that he didn't have, and they became very, very good friends and would go canoeing. And so Becky Mason was very good to me, giving me all sorts of good stories about them together. Uh, there's the Mason family and their canoe. The best story of it all took place one spring on the Poconoke River near where they live in Chelsea, Quebec. And they went out just for a spring run, an overnight thing. And they stopped, and they started sitting around the campfire, and they were making food. And the Prime Minister of Canada and little Bill Mason got into a heated argument. Bill, who spoke in a kind of a squeaky voice, said, what the hell is the Maple Leaf doing on the Canadian flag? Pierre Trudeau had been elected in 1965, the year that they brought the Canadian flag in, and of course, loved the Canadian flag, said, the people love it. We put it on there. No, no, it should be a canoe. canoe. He said, <laughs> you ought to have the canoe on there. <laughs> the damn maple leaf. Now, it only goes out as far as Winnipeg at the most. You don't find it anywhere in the north. It doesn't exist in the vast majority of our country, but the canoe is everywhere. So it should be the canoe. And Pierre Trudeau argued back and forth, you can't now change, you can't take the red maple leaf off the flag and put the canoe on. <laughs> but Bill thought you could. And if you think about it, it would have made a very, very nice flag. We all love the Canadian flag as it is, but I think that the canoe on the flag would have been ideal. So I kind of vote for Bill on that one. Do you know, this story is not, not very well known either, but in 1987, when they decided to get rid of the $1 bill, they uh, held some contests with artists and that, and they had a judging panel, and they decided to go once again with the canoe and the voyageur and the First Nations paddler, only a different version of it. They put the dye together in Ottawa, and the mint was in Winnipeg, of course, and they sent it out to Winnipeg, the new dye to make the new $1 coin that was gonna change our country. And at the Winnipeg airport, whoever was in charge of getting it over to the Mint wouldn't pay the extra $28.75 required to have a courier take it directly there solo. Instead, they threw it in with a bunch of other packages at a cheaper price, and they lost it. <laughs> so the Mint's ready to run, but they have no dye. So in panic, they go back to Ottawa, and they said, we've got to get this thing rolling. We've got all our presses ready to go and everything. So they sent out the number two thing. It had a loon on it. And so that's why you have a loony instead of a canoony. <laughs> and if you had a canoony, would the dollar be sinking? <laughs> that's my friend Phil. 
Phil, uh, that's on the Des Moines River. Phil's many claims to fame, he would say, but the one claim to fame, what I will grant him, is that he improved on Pierre Burton's line that a true Canadian knows how to make love in a canoe. Phil says, anyone can make love in a canoe. It's a Canadian who knows enough to take out the center thwart. <laughs> well, the best thing about canoeing is canoeing with your own family. And a simple trip, a new place, and just going about quietly. It's one of ours. That's just the Barren Canyon, a very simple trip, very lovely. Bill Mason said, first God created a canoe, and then he created a country to go with it. And we are fortunate enough to be in this country with the red maple leaf on our flag. So thank you.